So far, 2024 is shaping up to be the year of OLED. By now, you've heard all of us reviewers glaze OLED technology for its clearly superior image quality over TN, VA, and IPS panels. And if the past few weeks are any indicator, this might finally be the year where 4K gaming has me in a complete chokehold. Today, we're checking out the PG32 UCDM 4K 240Hz monitor from ASUS. This is using the same third gen QD OLED panel from Samsung that we saw recently on the Alienware. This monitor arrived a day before the embargo lifted, so I wanted to spend some real time with this this before I ship the video. This is also coming in at the top of the price spectrum at $12.99 US. That's $100 more than the Alienware. The biggest and most obvious difference from the Alienware is that this panel's flat, which I'm really happy to see. The curve on the Alienware isn't really that aggressive, but that along with just the physical aesthetic of these monitors are probably gonna be two of the biggest points of personal preference because a lot of the tech on offer here is pretty similar. Well, Almost. When you look at a monitor with specs like this, your first reaction is that it's probably ideal for big 4K single player experiences, which it is. But it would be tough to get someone who's really into competitive shooters to look at a monitor format like this. First, it's obviously much harder to push frames at 4K than it is at 1440p or 1080p, but Physically, 32 inches is pretty big for competitive FPS. You really wanna be able to see all the information on your screen at the same time without having to move your head. So Asus has included a feature called Aspect Control. This allows you to simulate either a 27 inch or a 24.5 inch display window and it adjusts the output resolution with some pretty weird choices. For 27 inch, you'd think 2560 by 1440, but instead we get 3288 by 1850, not a lot easier than 4K resolution. For 24.5 inches, you'd think 1920 by 1080, but instead we get 2992 by 1682. But the magic here is that you're not locked into any of those resolutions. You can pick whatever resolution you want while you're simulating a smaller screen size. 27 inch simulated at 1440p still looks a little blurry. 24.5 simulated at 1080p still looks a little blurry. But 24.5 simulated at 1440p looks incredible. And you're able to push higher frames because that resolution's a lot easier to handle. If you have the GPU muscle, you can go 24 and a half inches at 4K resolution, and the detail is insane. Now, the only catch is that you do give up variable refresh rate to be able to do this, but when you're playing competitive at frame rates this high, it's not really a factor anyway, and it unlocks a ton of flexibility. Play it 27 inches at 4K if you want to. And because with OLEDs, black means black, not light gray, the borders here aren't distracting at all. It takes this feature from what felt like a gimmick to me on the PG27 AQN and turns it into what I think is a legit game changer. I mean, where are you gonna find a 240 hertz, 24 and a half, inch 1440p or a 240 hertz 4k 27 inch let alone one with all the benefits of oled that effectively makes this monitor a solid choice for single player casual fps and competitive fps and in a little bit we'll talk about why it's a banger choice for content creation too this monitor shares a lot aesthetically with asus's other oled offerings so we've got the thin panel itself a large heat sink on the rear this is totally passive so no fan noise at all to worry about for lighting we've got the typeface logo on the rear of the stand and down throw lighting on the base that projects onto the desk the these can both be disabled if you want. The large eye logo on the back of the monitor is assignable or disabled if you like, and there's a red lit eye logo right under the front bezel. This is the only lighting that can't be disabled. The stand has height, tilt, swivel, and there's just a hint of pivot. It's just enough to make sure you can level the panel if your desk isn't exactly level. Nice touch that the Alienware missed. We do get a 3 8 inch mount on top of the stand for adding lighting or a camera, or this does have a really beefy bracket if you prefer to mount this on an arm. We have two HDMI 2.1 ports here for console support, but again, we have DisplayPort 1. 1.4, like we saw on the Alienware, not DisplayPort 2.1. I do want to touch on this just because I've seen tons of comments under basically every OLED monitor review so far this year. It is a really deep topic. I don't want to derail the video too bad. There's a super deep write-up over at TFT Central if you want to learn more about it that I will link down in the description. I'm going to keep this light, but feel free to skip this section if you don't care. In the current market right now, there are no consumer NVIDIA GPUs that even support DisplayPort 2.1. On the AMD side, there are only two consumer GPUs that do, and even they they don't support the full ultra high bitrate spec, and there are no monitors on the market right now that support the full spec. The current monitors we have use something called DSC, or Display Stream Compression, to deliver these high resolutions at these high frame rates. DSC is described as virtually lossless compression, meaning people that see it can't tell the difference if it's on or off in terms of visual fidelity or quality. I've spent the past two weeks scouring the internet looking for anyone that says they can. 
I can't find them. Said plainly, there's no real current need for these monitors to support DisplayPort 2.1, but that's not really the issue people are having. You already have to have a pretty monster system to run modern AAA titles at even 120 hertz at 4K, so easy lift competitive FPS games aside, it's going to be quite a while before enjoying AAA games at 4K at 240 FPS is going to be a regular occurrence for most people. Most users buy the fastest monitor they can and then grow into it over time. You generally have your monitor longer than any other component in your setup. If you buy right, it'll last you at least two GPU cycles. That's where the friction comes in, because people want some guarantee of future-proofing if they're going to spend this kind of money. That's totally understandable, but the reality is we don't know if the next wave of GPUs are even going to support the full-spec version or the 13.5 version that we're seeing right now. Like the early mess of HDMI 2.1, they don't have to support the maximum spec to call it DisplayPort 2.1, and if they don't support the maximum spec, we're going to be using DSC anyway. It's also a way more complex issue than saying, well, it's backwards compatible, so the only reason monitor manufacturers aren't putting them on monitors right now is because they're being cheap. In reality, there's a few more components involved than just the port, and all that stuff has to play nice with the new standard, and it has to play nice with the existing standards that we already have. It looks like Gigabyte will probably be the first to market with the DisplayPort 2.1 enabled monitor later this year. They have released that they'll be using the UHBR20 spec, so that could be worth the wait if you're concerned about all this. I want to be really clear that I don't say any of that to endorse or excuse any brand's decision to exclude DisplayPort 2.1 right now. I just think we're further away than people think we are, and I don't think it's the make it or break it that people are making it out to be. Nonetheless, this monitor does give you the ability to disable DSC if you want. With this disabled, if you're running DisplayPort, that will limit you to 120 hertz, 10-bit, 422 color, limited range. If you're running that over HDMI 2.1, you get 120 hertz, 12-bit, 444 color, and limited range. So can I tell the difference between DSC on and DSC off? No, I can't, and I'd much rather have the benefits of running higher frame rates. We also get some other hardware perks we're not seeing on any of the other 4K 32 inches yet, like a USB hub, a full KVM switch if you want to use multiple systems, and there's no speakers here, but there is a headphone jack. The coating here is what most people would call glossy, but it's really more of a semi-gloss because it has elements of both glossy and matte coating. True glossy W OLED displays like you find on a TV tend to have straight up mirror reflections, and matte coatings tend to diffuse light into big blobs. These QD OLED panels tend to do a little bit of both, hence semi-gloss. Ideally, you'd have this situated somewhere in your room that doesn't have a direct light source shining on it, like a window. QD OLED specific tends to do better in dimmer or dark environments anyway because black levels are a big part of the OLED experience and QD OLED has a tendency to turn gray or even purple when you have high levels of ambient light in your room. Having spent a lot of time with both matte W OLED displays and these QD OLED displays, the black levels on W OLED do a much better job outside of a completely dark room where they tie. It is noticeable, but it's by no means a deal breaker. Plus, matte coatings have a tendency to add grain to the image that you don't get on QD OLED, so these often look more clear and the viewing angles are a lot better. There are some things that both flavors of OLED have in common, and it's a set of features that make these extremely impressive for gaming. The first is a crazy low gray-to-gray -gray response time, and OLED does this with very little overshoot, so inverse ghosting like you see here isn't an issue. Input latency or input lag is also super low. The theoretical perfect input latency for a 240 hertz display is 2.09 milliseconds. This monitor has a total input latency of 2.6 milliseconds. That is a 0.51 millisecond variance to perfect, and there's no way any human on Earth can tell me that they can perceive that. The other benefit to OLED is that it can do HDR without affecting that input latency at all, because all these pixels are self-lit, it doesn't require any additional processing time to do HDR, which we'll definitely talk about in a sec. Unlike gray to gray or pixel response time, motion blur has to do with what it looks like when your eyes are tracking an object moving across the monitor, and it's generally affected by the overall frame rate of the panel itself, and then by any sort of backlight strobing technology like DIAC or ULMB2, and you'll generally see these UFO tests from blur Busters used to illustrate this. Up until now, the best I've seen for motion blur have been the 540 hertz ASUS with ULMB2, the 360 hertz Zowie with DIAC, and the 360 hertz Alienware OLED, which lacks any backlight strobing tech because OLEDs don't use a backlight. Instead, on this monitor and their ultra-wide OLED they released before it, which we will check out pretty quick, ASUS is using something called ELMB, or Extreme Low Motion Blur, which is a black frame insertion mode. This simulates the concept of backlight strobing in LCD monitors, where the backlight is turning off in between frames. It's still pretty early for this tech, and it comes with some major trade-offs that you want to be aware of. When you're running it, you can't use HDR, you can't use variable refresh rate, and the biggest one is that the output of the monitor has to be capped at exactly 120 frames per second. The reason why is because the monitor is technically still running at 240 hertz, it's just displaying one live frame, and then one black frame, and then repeating. In addition to all that, it also massively reduces the brightness to just under 90 nits. It actually restricts the brightness adjustment itself to 70, and unlike ULMB2 on the LCD side, there's no way to adjust 
adjust the pulse width to increase the brightness. Here is the difference in motion blur between running at 120 hertz with no ELMB versus ELMB on. You can see it makes a big difference at 120 hertz, but here it is versus running the monitor without it at 240 hertz, really close. This mode does work if you set the output of the monitor to 120 hertz, but then you're playing a title that doesn't output that fast, like a locked 60 FPS. You might see this on consoles or on fighting games. They're usually locked at 60 FPS because fighting game engines rely on precise frame timing. It is nice to have the option, but I think this mode is gonna come down to really specific use cases. Even if you're playing on a console, you probably don't wanna skip HDR, which consoles generally handle really well, or variable refresh rate. This monitor is both FreeSync Premium Pro and G-Sync compatible certified, and I'm very happy to report that my copy didn't show any VRR flicker. I think one of the more interesting uses for this mode is using it to reduce motion blur on older emulated titles that are often capped at 60 FPS, places where VRR, HDR aren't really gonna matter. Nonetheless, there's no escaping that significant hit to brightness. Speaking of, max full screen SDR brightness on this panel comes in at just over 250 nits, which is what you expect to see from OLED. QD OLED can also appear brighter when the image is full of a lot of bright colors. I never run this monitor at full brightness. I usually keep it at like a 65 or 70. Out of the box with the monitor in racing mode, which is the default setting and the one to use, we've got pretty solid performance. The white balance comes in right around 6400 with 6500 being perfect. Gamma also comes in at 2.16 with 2.2 being ideal. Delta E averages are very strong too, so there's no color tint across that grayscale range. This monitor ships in wide gamut color mode. That gives us 99.1 DCI-P3 coverage. This makes for punchier colors, which I personally prefer for gaming, but they can be oversaturated for media. If you need to work in a more accurate mode or if skin tones are just look a little fried in videos, you can always go with the sRGB mode instead. We've got extremely impressive color accuracy here, which again, makes this monitor an excellent one and done choice for both gaming and content creation work. This for me is better than using the sRGB Cal mode where the accuracy is a little tighter, but you lose access to the majority of the color controls. SDR performance on this monitor is top tier, but one of the big reasons to go OLED is for HDR, not just because it doesn't add any input lag for processing time, but because each pixel on an OLED turns on and turns off, so when it's black, it's completely off. This means not having to worry about dimming zones like we see on other monitor technologies, so you can have bright white and full black right next to each other with no haloing. And the HDR experience here is very good. I recently upgraded my testing capabilities here via Kalman Ultimate from Portrait Displays so we can take a closer look. What we want to see is how accurately the panel is handling the luminance levels for the very dark and the very bright areas that the scene is calling for and how accurate the colors are while it's doing that. Looking at the luminance levels of the grayscale, the closer this gray line hugs this yellow target line as it moves through the curve, the better the performance. We get four modes on offer for HDR. It ships in console HDR, which I would use for any type of HDR content, gaming or otherwise. This mode has the most accurate grayscale tracking and it also has the most accurate color tracker results at just 2.63 average Delta ITP variants with three being the target. Really impressive. You can of course play around with the different modes and just see which one looks good to you. Try cinema HDR when you're watching a movie and see how it looks. Objective data is really important to make sure these products are functioning as advertised, but at the end of the day, use it how you wanna use it. This monitor is also able to hit a peak brightness of over 1000 nits as advertised for up to a 2% window. Full screen HDR brightness is just north of 260 nits. So objectively, we know it's offering very solid HDR performance and subjectively, it's absolutely gorgeous. Since there's no hit to input lag, I found myself playing titles in HDR that I normally wouldn't. Modern Warfare looks insanely impressive at 4K with HDR. One thing not on offer here yet is support for Dolby Vision. Asus does have plans to add it in a future firmware and Alienware supports it now and they've just recently released a firmware that allows you to manually toggle it on and off. I've seen a lot of commentary about Dolby Vision, but I was really surprised to find out that thanks to Windows, Dolby Vision on the PC is a complete mess. As best I can tell, there've only ever been four games that supported Dolby Vision and not all four of them currently support it. It's kind of a mess on the console side too. PS5 has no support for Dolby Vision. Xbox Series X supports it for a short list of games and for streaming services, but not for the disc drive, so no physical media. You still need a standalone dedicated Blu-ray player for that. I just don't see this being a big factor for a lot of people. I do want to touch on text clarity briefly, only to say that at this size and pixel density at 4K, I really don't think this is an issue here. I can't say that of the 1440p OLEDs we've seen where it's much more obvious, but in 4K, I just don't think it's much of an issue. And you really can't have a conversation about OLED without talking about burn-in. These newer panels have more anti-image retention tech than ever before. This unit even allows you to disable some of that, though I don't recommend doing that. I don't have any experience running a QD OLED display long-term in a productivity environment, but I do have plenty of experience running a W OLED LG TV as my primary production monitor for well over two years. I'm not careful with it. I leave it on all the time. The toolbar stays on the screen all the time. I don't have any burn-in. 
yet. As a reviewer, it's probably irresponsible for me to recommend using a QD OLED as a production monitor, but all the specs of this monitor make it really great for both gaming and content creation work. This is also the first time Asus has offered a full three-year warranty, including burn-in protection, so they seem to be putting their money where their mouth is by offering the same warranty that you see on the Alienware side. I know that was a ton of info today, so I don't want the message to get lost in the mix that this is just an incredible monitor. This is what you'll see on my desk for the time being if I'm not specifically reviewing a different monitor. Because of the speed, the accuracy, and the aspect control feature, this is truly the first monitor I feel comfortable recommending as a one and done monitor. It is the peak of what we've seen so far, but it's not end game. It's early still. OLEDs are only going to get brighter and faster and more resistant to burn in as time goes on. Even inside this year, there is still a few pretty exciting OLED releases to come. I think the only people this won't appeal to are the diehard ultra wide crowd or the really serious competitive FPS crowd that are chasing frame rates higher than 200. That dual mode 240 4K with the 480 hertz 1080p mode is still coming, and if they handle it like they did here, that might be the one. With the aspect control, the extra USB and KVM hardware, I think it's easily worth the $100 price premium over the Alienware, and unless you just really want a curved panel, I think this is currently the one to beat. Very easy recommend. That's it for today. Thanks so much for watching, and I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.